Well, we are going to continue our series on preparing for redigging the wells of revival. And some of you might feel, well, it's not, how, it, how does it impact me individually? It does. You know, what happens in our nation impacts us. What happens in our city impacts us. You know, even recent fires, and we need to be aware of what is happening in the nation and be involved in what is going on. And I, I was reading about some bills that have been discussed in California and really bothered me. And really, I thought maybe the Christians are not being involved in the governmental process. Uh, you know, we need Christians to be involved in politics. We need Christians to be involved in uh, being school superintendents in uh, being state senators, you know, or being in the House of Representatives. It's, it, is, it is not that much work. You can actually volunteer, run for an election, you can be on the school board. You know, it is really, uh, and we cannot complain when things are going south, because then we have not been involved in the community. So that's why I think, uh, involving in what is happening in the nation and praying for the nation. You know, the Lord says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. You know, every church, all the 300,000 churches in America, big or small, we all need to pray for the nation. This is the time to really rise up and say, we are called to pray. We are called to intercede. Maybe sometimes we can cancel our fishing trips. Nothing against fishing trips. You know, I've done fishing only once, and I, and I caught a catfish. It was a fun time. Nothing against fishing trips, but we need to understand where the nation is. So that's why we'll continue the series, preparing to redig the wells of revival. And today we'll talk about seeking God's face. Say with me, seeking God's face. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this wonderful morning, Lord. And Master, even as we continue to focus on preparing to redig the wells of revival, Lord, give us insight, give us a direction from the word, how to prepare and how to redig these wells of revival. We thank you and praise you. Thank you, Master. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week, we talked about preparing to redig the wells of revival. A few things we addressed. First of all, we need to have a burden for revival. You know, we need to know what is happening in the nation. We need to understand that what goes on in the nation, the laws that are being passed is going to impact our family. You know, it's going to impact our friends. And that's why we need to understand that praying for the nation is not a choice. It's not just for a few chosen intercessors. Praying for the nation, we must all pray for the nation as believers. We must all as churches be involved in praying for the nation. It's not an option, you know. Some people might say, well, those are the people, the ministers are chosen to pray. No, the intercessors are chosen to pray. That's not the way the word of God says it. Burden for revival. Secondly, humbling ourselves. You know, if we are prideful, you know, God will not lift us up. Pride comes before a fall. But when we humble ourselves and we lift up the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, that's when we can really worship the Lord. We cannot even worship the Lord without humbling ourselves. And then the third one was, and pray. And pray. It is important to pray for the nation. It's important to pray as individuals. It's important to pray as families. It's important to pray with your spouse. Have a Prayer time with your spouse, it has helped us a lot. We have been doing prayer walks for several months now. So uh, you can learn, uh, learn from that. And it's really powerful. And the, the relationship in the family becomes much stronger. We and pray. And if you really look at Second Chronicles 7, 13 and 14, you know, the context of the pandemic is there, you know. It clearly says in the verse 13 that 
if there is a pestilence among the people, among my people, then what should be the response of God's people is Second Chronicles 7 and 14. And we know the verse and I'm not going to repeat that verse. It's about God's people. It's about the church. It's not about the world. And that's why the Lord gave me this phrase, even as I was speaking last week, that the revival is stopped by the church, not by the world. You know, that really freed me. You know why? Because there might be a lot of evil in the world. But if the church understands that we are the ones who stop the revival, or we are the ones who begin the revival, then we will not be concerned about the evil in the world discouraging or disparaging the work of God for revival. You know, that's what I'm talking about. Of course, we should be concerned about what is happening, but know that what is happening out in the world is not going to stop the revival of the nation. And that's so freeing for me. You know, it's, it's about a group of people gathering together in a sacred assembly. It could be 10 people, 12 or even less. Having a heart for God and crying out to God is what will bring that revival. We need to seek God's face. We need to seek God's face. You know, think about it. We always say, you know, let's have a face-to-face -face meeting. How many are familiar with that term? In fact, I probably said that uh, to Sam a few days back. Let's have a face-to-face -face meeting. You know, there is something about face to face. That's why Zoom is taking off, you know, because though we cannot come together, we can still see the person. You no, know, there is something about seeing the person. You can communicate so effectively. You can connect effectively. You can build that relationship. You know, that's why the word of God says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, not only we should humble ourselves and pray, but we need to seek God's face. We need to seek God's face. We need to be hanging out with God, if you will, if I may use that term. We should have a hunger to hang out with God. We should enjoy our time with the scriptures. We should enjoy and look forward to the time that we spend in our quiet times with God. Are we all there yet? You know, if we are not there, then we need to continue to pursue and nothing. I'm, I'm not here to say to judge anyone. All of us are on a journey. But if we want to see the nation healed, you know, it's about God's people really pursuing to seek God's face. We have to be God chasers. Even as Tommy Tenney so eloquently wrote that book, we need to chase after God. It's, it's like a parent, you know, hiding from a one-year-old or a two-year-old toddler. You know, I'm sure Brother Udaya will do that soon. You know, when Timothy is... Uh, crawling or uh, being a toddler there. But the point is, you know, parents like to hide and then have the children find them. How many can relate? You know, I have done that before. That's how God wants uh, his children to pursue him, to seek him, to search him. You know, and we need to be like children. You know, as somebody has said, God does not have any grandchildren. All of us are his children. You know, he wants each one of us to search out, search him out, if you will. The word seek, I looked it up, it means to search out. To search out. It's like, I don't know if you've had this situation, but if... Your son or daughter gets lost in a crowded area. How would you feel? And I, I know a situation happened here for Brother Sam. And I have had a situation with uh, Josh. I'm just putting, uh, put, putting that out there. Uh, but, but the thing is, I know what goes through our heart when you see that one of your children is missing. 
But then what do we do? We search out. Whatever it takes, right? Even with tears in our eyes, we are searching out our child when he's lost. That's how God wants us to have that kind of a burden to search him out. You know, I, I remember uh, this was at a museum and both Hannah and Joshua were there. Um, I think Pastor Jemima was traveling on ministry. So, and they were in two different uh, places in the same big room doing some activity. So, and then my plan was to just spend two minutes here, go two minutes there, check on each of the child. And that was my job for uh, that afternoon. And then I came after a few iterations, I came and I saw Josh is not there. My heart sank. It was so crowded. Very crowded. Where will I go find him? I just ran on the entire floor, just frantically asking people, have you seen a little boy walking around here? You know, it was probably the most scary time of my life, at least one of the most scary times. And then I came back to the room, couldn't find him. And I was praying, you know, you'll pray desperately when, when there is a need like that. And suddenly the Lord put a thought in my heart, go check the restroom. Because that's where we had gone just before they started the work again. And he was there. And I thank God. You know, God will protect our children. But it took some searching out. And God wants us as his children to search him out. We need to pursue him and understand that that is going to be a great blessing for us because as we pursue him, as we abide in his word, he will abide in us if you will. Deuteronomy 6 and 5 says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. You know, I really pray that the Lord will pour his love in our hearts so that we can love him back with all our heart. You know, not give a portion of our heart to something else. Maybe we, we like music, you know, but then music shouldn't come before God. Maybe we like football. You know, anyway, God has stopped all these idol, uh, idols in the nation. Maybe it's time to reset. We need to recalibrate our priorities, even as a nation. You know, the idols of entertainment and sports and NBA and NFL, and I love some of these. Don't get me wrong. But, but the Lord is saying something to us that we need to recalibrate what are our priorities and not have anything ahead of God. Because then that becomes idolatry. And that's what we are talking about here, loving God with all of our heart. Everything, that's the spirit man, with all of our heart, with all of our soul. Soul means mind, will, and emotion. Everything, it's all in. You know, we need to be all in with God. Not say, hey, I'm going to follow God, but I have a backup plan. No, it doesn't work like that. Either you are all in or you are not in. That's how it is. And he expects us to put him in the highest priority. And then with all your strength. And I was thinking about it. We need to expend our strength for God. You know, whatever it takes to serve God with what he has given you the assignment for. You know, you put all in, all the strength in. You know, not some people say all in and in a few weeks they are all out, unfortunately. But I think it's a serious business. You know, when you say all in, you, you mean it and you do and put everything that you have in the work of God. Give, serve him with all our strength. That's what will be the proof in the pudding, if you will. You know, do you really love him with all your heart, with all your mind? And soul. James 4 and 8 says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. You know, he is a gentle God. He has not created robots. 
he wants us to draw near to him he wants us to worship him he wants us to spend time with him he wants us to have that intentionality and a plan on our calendar saying i'm going to meet god at this time and it's okay to miss a few don't beat yourself up but do you have a time with god do you have a time with god that you are looking forward to you know i know sometimes we look forward to a meeting with a huge an executive from a large company you know but this is the king of kings and the lord of lords are we looking forward to our time with god are we having the heart to draw closer to god do we have the intentionality to draw closer to god the word says he will draw near to you when we draw near to god he will draw near to you you know we want the lord the king of kings near to us so that we can make the right decisions we can hear from god we can seek his face we can see what really burdens his heart it's important to have that closeness in that relationship with god and then the word of god continues to say cleanse your hands you sinners and purify your hearts you double minded are our hands clean are our hearts pure when it's a question to ask otherwise there is a solution we can go back to god and repent you know that's the beauty of uh, of our relationship with our father you know there is there is forgiveness but then we cannot keep sinning if we continue to sin and continue to fall that means you have not really repented we cannot continue to sin in the same area you know there has to be a true repentance you will really turn from the wicked ways which we'll see next week it has to be a true turning that's when you will not go back to the vomit like the dog goes back to its vomit it is important to truly repent and turn and and remove all kinds of traces of of that sin if you will remove everything in fact i will talk next week but uh, hal sacks really clarified that word to me in fact destroy the things that you are moving away from so that you don't come back to it destroy it because humans might go back to it even as a dog goes goes back to its vomit you know it's interesting and if you when we are in the god's presence of the lord we'll be convicted of sin see if we go far from god sometimes the conviction of sin will also not be there and you'll continue in sin only when you draw near to god god will tell us well you need to fix in these areas you need to forgive those people you know maybe we have hurt so many people and we'll probably never know so it's good to forgive it's good to forgive any anything we have to uh, pray for those who persecute us and love our enemies i mean the the yardstick of the scriptures is much higher you know the puritans used to say pride is the last sin to leave and the first sin to come back i think they had some good insight you know we have to always watch ourselves for the pride we have to watch ourselves all of us because pride i i really believe that pride is the last sin to leave and the first sin to come back and then andrew murray says pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you i love that pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you you know that's how much god hates a prideful person you know he will he will not tolerate that in psalm 14 and 2 it says the lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek god you know god is actually looking down from heaven upon the children of men to see if any who understand and seek god any so he is watching all of us 
he is watching the children of men to see if any who understand who seek god you know the word understand there is intelligent circumspect and hence intelligent consider prudent wisdom having awareness of something so god is looking for understanding do we really understand and have that wisdom to seek god because when we are walking with god you know he can speak to you and you are led by the lord see then then life can become a great joy every moment you can literally live in a revival bubble a personal revival bubble of great peace of great joy it is possible it is possible otherwise isaiah 26:3 won't be true one whose mind is stayed on him will be in perfect peace you can walk in perfect peace despite what is happening around you despite what is happening to you to your family still it is possible to walk in perfect peace because we need to understand that we need to seek god we need to pursue god we need to draw near to god that's when we can be in his presence and in his presence is fullness of joy and then we can really live a life of great joy it is possible to do that you know job was wise and he said job 5 and 8 he said but as for me i would seek god and to god i would commit my cause so job was wise he had understanding he said as for me i would seek god and to him i would commit my cause whatever cause it is whatever challenge it is you just commit it to god place it on on the lord if you are carrying a burden on your shoulders place it on the lord like job said it with a lot of wisdom there you know we need to love the lord with all of our heart all of our soul all of our mind and all of our strength and it can there is things we can see are we really do we really love god so much and we all need to grow there you know a w tozer said this i love jesus because he is my savior i fear him because he is my judge i love jesus because he is my savior i fear him because he is my judge i think it's a very good balance you know we we have to be careful when we read the word you know yes he is a loving god but he is also a judge you know that keeps us stable actually we need to know we need to really have the fear of god of course he is a loving god he is a merciful god but he is also a judge and i believe that really balances our understanding of god and we need to know that that he i fear him because he is my judge psalm 24 3 and 4 says who may ascend into the hill of the lord or who may stand in his holy place he who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully you know to really go into the presence of god we need to have clean hands and pure heart really to be under the shadow of the almighty we need to have a pure heart otherwise we'll always have that distance because we are not loving god with all our heart in order to love god with all of our heart we need to have that pure heart that sincere heart that that we are pursuing god and clean hands you know in our nation with abortion and other things as an identification we can say our hands are not clean even as a nation but then we can repent and the blood of jesus can cleanse us and not only cleanse us but heal the land you know the blood shed actually defiles the land that's what the word of god says any innocent blood shed will defile the land will defile the nation to a point that even crops might be impacted you know there are examples of revival where when the presence of the lord came the fish came back in the rivers the crops started to grow well the fruits were much bigger than what they should be you know because there is a defiling of the land through the shedding of innocent 
blood, who can stand in the hill, ascend into the hill of the Lord. It's those who have clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands and a pure heart. And the word of God says in Matthew 5 and 8, Blessed are those with a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. You know, it's the same verse the other way around. You know, blessed are the pure in heart, so they will see God. They are the ones who can, who can come into the presence of the Lord. The holy of holies, if you will. The shadow of the Almighty, if you will. If you are able to see a shadow of a person, you are pretty close to that person. You are under the shadow, meaning you are so close to the Almighty God. To be there, we need to have a pure heart. Because without a pure heart, we cannot see God. You know, the psalmist in Psalm 42 says it so eloquently, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my so pants my soul for you. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you. O oh God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? You know, psalmist wants to appear before God. He is asking God, when can I come and appear before God? And he is thirsting for God. We need to thirst for God like the psalmist. And even as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you. Can we, can we say that to God? As the deer pants for the water brooks. The word pan, panting is actually the word orag. And we don't have to worry about how this spell it. But the meaning is to long for or to cry. The word pant means to long for or to cry. You know, it's like when a deer is desperate and thirsty, you know, how much it will long to find a water brook. When you're hungry for God, how much you will pant to find the presence of God, how much you will seek after God, how much you will pursue God, you know, to long for or to cry. That's what David longed for. You know, David became king, of course, but, but his Longing was not for the throne. His longing was not for a big house. His longing was not for him to have his own kingdom. But his longing, and he was panting for God. You know, it really puts everything else in its place. We need to have our priorities right. What are we panting for? What are we really focused on? We have to seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. And we can learn from David there. You know, he was not panting for his throne. He was not strategizing how, of course, he knew he was anointed, but there were so many challenges. But he was focused on God. He was inquiring of God. He was communicating with God. He was near God. He was seeking God's face. And that's why things fell in place for his life. You know, Spurgeon, I think the sermon, last two sermons, I didn't use Spurgeon, so it's time. I love Spurgeon. Um, amazing man of God. I mean, you should hear his sermons when he spoke as a 20-year-old. I'm blown away by the calling and by the study uh, of the word of God. Uh, amazing. Amazing man of God. So this is why he wrote a song. And don't worry, I will not sing it. Some of you are concerned. The song by Spurgeon shows his thirst for God. He says, might I enjoy the meanest place. Meanest meaning the most insignificant. Might I enjoy the meanest place within your house, O God of grace, not tents of ease, nor thrones of power should tempt my feet to leave your door. You know, he, he, similar to the Psalm 42, I thought, you know. So he's saying, might I enjoy the meanest place? He would prefer to sit in a corner of the house of God. Within your house, O God of grace, not tents of ease, nor thrones of power. You know, he's not saying, I want a tent of ease, meaning 
He is not serving God in any way. He is just living his own life in his own tent, in his, with his own family, with his own considerations. And maybe saying, those others will serve God. Those others will intercede for the nation. Those others, maybe I'll give them some offering. We talked about this yesterday. And when I was preparing, I was connecting with our conversation, you know. I said, yeah, the Lord was speaking to us. You know, we, need, we all need to serve God. You know, the reason we have not reached the nations with the gospel is our mentality has been, okay, they will take care of preaching. They will take care of sharing tracts. They will do the intercession. How about you? How about you? We need to understand what our assignment is and do that. It's not about those people will do it. How about you? Don't be in the ease of your tent. Don't be in the ease of your tent. There is so much to do. Nor thrones of power. You might, be in, you might be the president of a large company. But are you serving God? I want to challenge you today. Because I have read so many stories in, in the past. Where CEOs of Fortune 500 companies were planting churches in many nations. Because they have the resources. Are you helping the local community? You know, we need, to, we need to challenge sometimes. And the Lord may speak to you with that challenge. You know, Psalm 84 and 10 says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. Day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. The tents of wickedness. You know, there is a protection for the people of God. There is a protection for, for people who serve God. So though you are spending time in serving God, you know, it's a seed that you are sowing. You know, when you are sowing that seed, God will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. He will surround you with mountains, like mountains around Jerusalem. You know, your faith will grow so that the fiery darts of the enemy will not even touch you. You know, there is a tremendous protection in serving God. There is a tremendous protection in coming nearer to God. You know, he is not asking us to come nearer to him so that he can be happy. Of course, he is happy because he knows my children are worshipping me. But it is for our protection. When we are near under the shadow of his wings, we will be protected. There will be mountains surrounding us. We will be in the bunker of the Lord. The enemy might throw fiery darts. You won't even see it because the shield of faith has grown. You are close to God. Your word, you are growing in the word. You are understanding the word. You are getting new revelations from the word. The shield is growing. And when the fiery darts come, you won't even see it. And that's how we can live in that bunker of the Lord. We can live in the pavilion of the Lord. We can go into the strong tower of the Lord. That's when we can experience that safety. It is possible. My people, we need to all get there. We need to get there. Seeking God. It's so important. The abiding fellowship with God. And I'm also challenging the young people who are watching and even here, you know, we must pursue God with all our strength, love God with all our heart. There is a great blessing there. You know, it's he, of course, God is happy with that, but there is a great blessing that comes to you as well. You know, even like Enoch and Noah walked with God. You know, we need to have that goal to walk with God. I want to walk with you, Lord. Show me how. Show me how I can draw near to you. You know, spend time with God. God will use us. He is not a respecter of persons. You know, I remember in 2017, I think it was May time frame, I went to Bonnie Bray House. And uh, I was supposed to be in a conference in Long Beach. And before leaving, one day before, the Lord clearly put on my heart, go to Bonnie Bray House. And I was arguing with the Lord. Well, I have been to Bonnie Bray House and I have taken my picture outside. You know how that goes. <laughs> That's a check mark. I don't need to go back. That's what I was telling the Lord. 
The Lord said, no, no, go to Bonnie Bray house. You have to go inside. And then anyway, long story short, I Googled, how do we really go to Bonnie Bray house? And they said, um, you have to call so and so person. Here's the number, blah, blah, blah. And, and then they, there were some discussion boards that they were saying it's very hard to find that person. So I said, I thought, I told the Lord, I'll call once. If I don't hear from them, I'll continue with my conference. You know how that goes. So I take the phone call. First ring, she picks up. <laughs> I knew it was a setup from the Lord. Anyway, long story short, and I told her, I have a window of time that I can come today. Are you available? Yes, I am available. <laughs> then I said, okay, I'll go. So anyway, it was a great experience to go to Bonnie Bray House. I'm glad the Lord asked me to go. And uh, she was standing right there on time. You know, I didn't have any way to say, tell the Lord, she was not there, I'm leaving. <laughs> I was not planning to do that. But anyway, I was blown away. You know, when we entered the living room there, I could really sense the presence of God right there. I could feel um, that this is a place of prayer. This is a place where saints who seek God's face prayed together. You know, they have the piano there, which Jenny Moore played. I don't know if you've read about Azusa Revival, but when the Holy Spirit fell on April 9th, 1906, there were 12 people in the room and um, Jenny Moore, who, was, who lived across the street, was in the group and she started playing the piano without having any training and she became the worship leader and later on uh, William Seymour's wife, worship leader for the Azusa Street Movement and Revival. So anyway, I, we were I was sitting there, she was sharing with me a lot of miracle stories that have happened right in that room. A lot of healings and some people even played the piano by themselves without being trained. That miracle happened several times even after that. And then this particular gentleman walks in and uh, it was Pastor Gerald uh, who was our contact person for Bonnie Bray House. And, and we were talking, we prayed together, we were talking about where the nation is. You know, he literally had tears in his eyes. He specifically said these words, the body of Christ does not thirst after God anymore. I remember that conversation and he had tears in his eyes. I appreciate Pastor Gerald. He has a heart for God and he has a heart to see revival. And uh, that's why again, we are collaborating with him with, for Bonnie Bray House for various things. But I appreciate his heart. And we, we need to learn from people around us and iron sharpens iron, if you will. You know, Psalms, Psalm 91, 1, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's what we are talking about, seeking God, seeking his face. And then verse 4 says, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. How true that is, he'll cover us and protect us with his wings. But we need to close, we need to be close to him so that he can do that for us. Amen. You know, in Isaiah 45, let me read Psalm 84. Psalm 84 and 2, my soul longs, Yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My soul longs, yes, even faints. Faints mean, means finished or perished. You know, it, he longs after God so much that if he is not able to be near him, he might even perish. That's the kind of expression the psalmist is using. You know, and if you really think about it in Isaiah 45 and 19, let's read that verse. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. You know, there is always a benefit for seeking God. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. You know, in order to hear 
God speak to us, we need to seek him. We need to be near him. Otherwise, how will we hear? We need to be seeking his face. Otherwise, how will we be near so that we can hear his voice because he speaks righteousness. He'll speak that rhema word for you and I that's applicable for that day. He speaks righteousness and he declares things that are right. You know, he will declare to you things that are right. And the word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and light unto your path. You know, it's important for all of us to be in that time we spend with God so that we can receive that Rema word so we carry on. You know, if we really do not pray in the morning for some reason, you will see throughout the day. But if you have spent time in prayer, you know, as John Wesley even said, you know, he said, I have, a, I have so much work today that I will start my day with three hours of prayer. What would we say? I have so much work today that I'm going to skip prayer. Do we say that? That's a dangerous statement. You know, the more you must do, the more you must pray. Because then everything becomes easy. You know, people you have been chasing after six months, they will call you. I've had that experience so many times. You know, you've been trying to get to some people and they will off. Out of the blue, call you. We need to have the invest that time in prayer. There is no other way. We have to invest that time to see things go in the right direction for us, if you will. You know, when we seek after God, let's read John 7. A couple of things and then we can close. Uh, John 7, 37. John 7, 37 through 39. On the last day... That great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You know, if we, if we thirst after God, if we seek his face, if we seek after God, we will receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But this he spoke concerning the spirit. You know, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit. And if you really think about Azusa revival, or any revival for that matter, you know, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is, is, is the beginning of that revival. Even as we see in Acts, you know, when the Holy Spirit fell, that, that's when the church was revived. That when, that's when the apostles were emboldened and they were bold to preach. And people who were afraid were now speaking and thousands were being saved. You know, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is an important aspect. And when does that happen when we have the right heart? And that's why, you know, even if you think about William Seymour, you know, who started from Houston. He was in Houston at a Bible college. And uh, back in the day, I think 1905, uh, towards the end of 1905, I think he moved to California. And there was uh, Jim Crow laws going on. There was a lot of racism going on. He wanted to study the scriptures. You know, uh, Daniel, it was very sad that he was sitting outside the classroom and listening to the scriptures. But his heart was right. His heart was broken. His heart was contrite. You know, he, he humbled himself. You know, we wonder why William Seymour was used for bringing the greatest revival on the face of the earth. You know, his heart was right. He was seeking after God. He didn't care about the injustice to him personally. You know, there might be injustice to us personally, but just ignore it. Ignore it and just seek after God. That's what he did. You know, and then when an opportunity came to move to California, he moved as a pastor. And then within a few weeks, as he was preaching on the Holy Spirit, he got fired. Because they didn't believe in the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he found himself without a job. Found himself living in the living room of a janitor at a local bank who was part of that church. You know, he helped him to at least have a roof over his head. But then he spent time in the word. Seven or eight hours, he was just crying out to the Lord, reading, reading God's word, seeking after God. You know, that's why God used him. If you really think about his heart was right. 
His heart was humbled. His heart was contrite. His heart was broken. And he was totally seeking after God. And that's why the Holy Spirit anointing fell. And in fact, the Lord, he didn't receive the Holy Spirit anointing first. It was Jenny Moore who received. I am blown away by that. Though he was preaching the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he received only on April 12th. And many others in his group. You know, even there you can see God honoring his humility, you know, it's amazing. It's amazing. And we were at a, a house of prayer in Washington, D.C. And it's an amazing house. You know, they, they have a chair that Abraham Lincoln had used in that house. And they have a lot of documents about Charles Parham. So for me, it was like a kid in a candy store. You know, there were some amazing books on revivals. Uh, so Pastor Jemima and I were just uh, both kids in a candy store and looking at these different journals. And they were all research about Charles Parham's ministry. And, and that's when I read uh, uh, William Seymour had written a letter to Charles Parham. And that letter is there in that book. And he had written, you know, the Holy Spirit came at 4 a.m. in the morning. So they were praying through the night. You know, there is something about praying in the night. And even I'm encouraged, even in the conversations with a couple of leaders uh, in the last week, two of them told me God, they are praying at 3 a.m. They have a conference bridge prayer at 3 a.m. praying for America. I was encouraged, you know, and sometimes we feel, well, it's maybe just our group is praying. No, there is many who are praying. And many who, who hunger for revival, who thirst for God, who are seeking God, who are waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning to dial on a conference bridge to pray for the nation. I really, I was encouraged by hearing two women leaders telling me that within, within the last uh, 72 or 96 hours, you know, and I was really encouraged. And there is, there is a remnant in every state in the nation. We are excited that 25 states are hosting it. We are excited that there's multiple streams of prayer and multiple uh, ministries that have been uh, hearing from the Lord for this prayer movement during the fall feast. And we are excited about that. And I know there is going to be a great harvest in, in terms of revival. And we will see that revival in our land. We will see that revival in our state. You know, we might see evil in the state of California, but, but the people of God are going to gather. And I challenge all of you who are in California, please come and be part of the Azusa Revival, redigging the wells of revival. It's in Los Angeles, by the way. The Azusa Revival site is in Los Angeles, and there are only 150 seats. So you must register quickly. And I feel it will really go off very, very quickly. It's a, it's a sacred assembly of warriors to cry out to the Lord. And I want you to be a part of it and pray about it and be part of it. You know, I have a few other stories, but maybe I'll share one quick story and we'll wrap it up. Um, it's about seeking God. One last uh, revival story. You know, Hebrides, <clears throat> the Lord reminded me about Hebrides revival and was talking to uh, Larry Lane from Sentinel Group. Uh, is there a documentary on Hebrides? And, and anyway, if you really think about Hebrides, there were two older women who really led the revival there. You know, uh, they were Peggy and Christine Smith, 82 and 84 year old. And they were not able to go about uh, to church. They were in their home. They were older. One was actually bent over, but they made their home the sanctuary of God. And they, God inspired in their heart, there is a revival coming, there is a revival coming. You know, they, they were the people who heard from the Lord and they were telling their church pastor, you know, you need to have a clean, you need to have clean hands and a pure heart. You know, it's good to hear from the people who hear from God. You know, they were warning the church pastor, they're saying, hey, the revival is coming, we are praying, we are praying. And they were actually declaring Isaiah 44 and 3. They were declaring Isaiah 44 and 3 for that revival. And you know what that says? For I'll pour water 
upon him that is thirsty and floods upon a dry ground i'll pour water upon whom who is thirsty are you thirsty for god are you thirsty for revival are you hungry for revival are you expecting revival i know there is many intercessors here and i appreciate each one who is an intercessor because they understand they understand about seeking god and like peggy and christine smith you know were declaring isaiah 44 and 3 they were saying hey if it's in the word it should be true for us i'll pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground is that not what we see in america a spiritual dry ground and i think we need to be declaring this verse even on the day on 26th you know to ask god to send us floods of the holy spirit floods of the outpouring of the holy spirit and he will pour water upon him who is thirsty i think our hearts are the most important thing in this you know each of our hearts especially people all of us who are really closely involved in this in this vision it's our vision you know and god is using us to bless the nation but our hearts need to be contrite our hearts need to be at the right place our hearts need to be really seeking after god and uh, coming near to god for us to take that and see that next revival you know we need to have that thirst you know because if our hearts are not right i mean all this effort for the entire year might go to a waste you know i think it's so important that our hearts are right let's stand up and pray our hearts must be right and even those who are watching and who are going to be with us at azusa street our hearts must be right and we need the right people with the right hearts there if the lord is tugging you please be join with us you know it's about our nation we can we can turn we can see the nation turn to god we can see the nation receiving that mighty outpouring of the holy spirit if just our heart is right and if we can have that repentance and and reconciliation and our heart is right and we can see that revival that we all are expecting and it will be a revival in our personal lives as well it will be a revival in our family lives as well thank you master Thank you Lord help us to seek after you help us to pant like that deer pants for the brooks of water let our soul pant for you let us long for you let us let us have that hunger and thirst for you Lord and let us prepare to redig the wells of revival Thank you master. Thank you master. Thank you master. Some of you might say, well I don't know this god. How do I how do I seek after a god I do not know? I want to share with you that you can also know this god. The king of kings and the lord of lords. The creator of the heavens and the earth. He is a loving God. He loves you. You might be in a tough spot, but He loves you. And all you need to say is, "I receive Him in my heart." And let's have a quick word of prayer for those who do not know the Lord. You might be watching this later. Let's have a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I have not known you, Lord Jesus. I have not known you in my life but today is my day I want to receive you in my heart as my personal lord and savior and I believe that you came down to this earth to die on the cross for me and you rose again on the third day and you're seated at the right hand of the father if you agreed with that prayer you are born again you are a new creation find a good church 
near you and be part of the community. Read your word. Please get in touch with us. If you are in San Jose, then connect with us, theblessing360.org, and you're welcome to be part of the blessing. Thank you, Master. Thank you for this wonderful moment. Lord, thank you for intercessors seeking after God, Lord Jesus, who understand that it's important to seek God. We thank you and praise you. Thank you, Master, for this time. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Master. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and forevermore.